Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Jeremy Powell. I'm a, a security architect for AMD, um, and I work on the Confidential Compute Solution, SNP. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about attestation. A lot of folks have asked about how does attestation work in SNP, and it's kind of complicated, so I'd like to kind of go through an explainer. <clears throat> so to overview what SCP is, we have three different features um, that kind of stack on top of each other. The first one is SEV. SEV provides the um, confidentiality of, um, of the confidential compute solution. <clears throat> we do this through memory encryption. And then SEV is covering only the memory uh, of a guest. SVES was introduced after that, and that includes the confidentiality and somewhat integrity of, uh, of the registers of the guest. These two features have um, a, a lighter weight threat model um, because we're only talking about confidentiality. In S&P, we, we introduce the idea of both confidentiality and integrity for a guest. Um, SEV and SEVES were introduced in first and second generation of Epic, and S&P was introduced in the third generation. So <clears throat> what is a threat model? I, I think that it's important to always talk about the threat model of whatever you're talking about, because um, oftentimes you can get off into the weeds about you know, the, the nitty gritty mechanics, and you forget what, what you're trying to address. So confidential compute's threat model is about confidentiality and integrity. Um, and it's about the flipped notion that the cloud provider or the hypervisor, the, the, the folks that are uh, hosting the, the guest, <coughs> uh, are not trustworthy. So they can um, do a number of different threats or uh, actions that amount to threats inside this threat model. They can run a malicious hypervisor. Um, the hypervisor can mix pages and alias pages and um, mess with invect, uh, injecting events into the guest unexpectedly. The cloud provider can run malicious guests um, in conjunction with attacks by the hypervisor. Uh, the, the cloud provider can um, have host applications to support that. They can run malicious devices. So you could think of uh, a malicious device is either being a commercial device that the hypervisor has programmed to try to touch guest memory, or you could think of even a you know, bespoke bad device intending, like built for the purpose of attacking guests. Um, and finally, we have the, the whole fact that the cloud provider is responsible for maintaining the configuration of the platform and for initializing and launching guests. So the, the hypervisor could run vulnerable firmware, or uh, it could run, um, it could lie and say, oh, this is you know, AMD hardware, and it really isn't. Um, and then when the hypervisor runs guests, then in, you know, in our model particularly, the hypervisor is responsible for bootstrapping the environment of, uh, of a secure guest, but maybe it doesn't do it correctly. Or maybe it does it in a way that the guest wasn't expecting. <clears throat> so these are both confidentiality and integrity uh, related threats. The hypervisor and the cloud provider are still expected to provide the availability to the guest. That's, you know, push the button over and over again to make sure it runs. So this talk is gonna focus on the threats around misconfiguring the platform and misconfiguring the guest on its launch. So we've heard a lot about attestation over the past week. Um, attestation in a confidentiality, uh, confidential guest environment, computa computational compute environment, is ultimately a case where the, the, the hardware that is enforcing the security properties of a confidential guest knows all of the measurements, all the inputs to the security, uh, security control, security policy, but it doesn't actually know the policy itself. So, you know, this is the case where um, our security processor knows uh, 
you know, the measurement of the guest or how the guest is laid out in memory or the version numbers of the firmware, but it doesn't know how to take that and turn that into a security decision. So attestation is necessary to delay and delegate that security decision to a, uh, a remote relying party. Like in, in our case, we're talking about the guest owner. So in attestation, the hypervisor is gonna launch the guest, the security processor grabs that information about what the, how the guest was launched, uh, it grabs information about the platform, it produces an attestation report, sends it to the guest owner, and then the guest owner is responsible for making the decision, yes or no, and it's only in that time that the guest actually gets the trust, be it like, I trust the workload, I trust this guest to do my workload, or I trust this guest to actually touch my secrets. And so the guest owner provides that through some channel that it sets up with the guest and says, hey, here's all your secrets, or here's the, some master secret to unlock a disk. In SP, this diagram maps really great, really directly. Our security processor is the one who's doing all the measurements. Um, and the AMD firmware, the x86 uh, um, uh, microcode, all that stuff is being, in, uh, is being collected by our, our security processor doing, uh, during, during this execution, during launch. So to talk about how we do attestation, we have to go through several different areas. Uh, we want to talk about the platform measurements themselves. We want to talk about how the guest is measured. We want to talk about how does the guest owner know whether or not the, the report that it receives is authentic. Um, we want to talk about, from a kind of a mechanical way, how does a guest owner get the attestation report? Um, and then we want to talk about, okay, so now you've attested the guest, now what? How do you, how do you connect the dots between a you know, a small kernel bootloader, OPMF, init RID, whichever you decide to measure, how do you connect that to the rest of the system? So our trusted computing base for a guest running an SP, it starts at the hardware root of trust. So we have a boot ROM, and the boot ROM is, 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 is executed by our security processor at the very beginning of boot. And that's where we derive our you know, manufacturing silicon uh, security. From there, trust is chained down to the security processor bootloader, the security processor operating system, the firmware that runs inside that security processor, like the application that does all the business logic for, for S&P. And then also a, a major part of our implementation is x86 microcode. And microcode can be patched, so it's a mutable thing that we need to measure. Oh, the, the rest of the, of the TCB is involving with the guest, so we, um, we, we want to measure the guest's image, we want to measure some of the metadata, we want to measure the runtime environment of what that guest looks like. So certain features could be turned on and off. Hypervisor has a great control over what that looks like, so we want to make sure that the guest owner sees that and can make a decision about whether it trusts that guest. <coughs> Okay, so the, 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 the thing that we report in our attestation report is um, for, for, for the identity of the mutable firmware that's in our system is the TCB version. So we, we build this TCB version string from the bootloader operating system firmware version and microcode patch level. This is built into basically a you know four component um, um, you know like major minor kind of thing where the bootloader's ver uh, SVN is uh, the most significant, whereas the x86 microcode patch level is the least significant, and we use that to order and, and compare patch levels or, or uh, TCB versions across different executions and to say this one has a greater version than this one. So. We track a lot of TCB versions in the implementation. Um, and a lot of this is built for the purpose of live update of our firmware. Some of the firmware can be updated. And so we want to make sure that we understand precisely what 
is running, could run in the future, was run at the launch of the GAST, um, and some other management. So the, the, we, have a, 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 well, we have the current version, which is the natural intuitive, what's running now. We have a committed version, which is our, um, it's the anti-rollback low watermark. So in the diagram, you can see kind of this timeline where you have a, uh, a committed version and a current version. And so what this is saying is that the current version is at version three, and it could potentially roll back to com the committed version, um, but it can't roll back to a previous version. And we allow this to happen to allow for uh, provisional updates. So if, uh, if a cloud provider wants to roll out firmware provisionally, try it out, figure it out, then we can allow it to go forward. But the only security we're going to guarantee is at the committed version. Um, so you know, we call this, when this, when this is, like in the diagram, we call that a provisional installation. There's a reported version um, that is uh, a management tool for us to display a version to the guest that is um, not surprising. So the hypervisor can set this reported TCB version to something that the guest is already using. So if, for instance, the, um, the hypervisor or the cloud provider wants to present, um, wants to install version three, guests are running at version one, or R2 here, um, it can set reported TCB to one, and that will be what the, 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 the version that's used for various different operations inside of our uh, firmware for you know, version keying, which I'll talk in a few minutes. Um, and it allows the, the case where uh, a guest can't process an, uh, an attestation report with a newer version. So reported version is a way to kind of hold off the visibility of the upgrade to the guest until infrastructure is in place so that the guest has, you know, it knows about the new version, it knows how to retrieve a certificate that's specific to that new version, and it won't fall on its face when it sees a brand new thing. We also track the launch version. So you can imagine if a guest is running um, and it starts off at an early version, and throughout the lifetime of execution of the uh, of S and P, you live update the firmware. Um, you may want to know what the what the what the version at the time of launch that guest had. So you know, okay, everything looks great, but my guest was launched at an early stage, an early version. I may have opinions about that as a guest owner. I may say, well, I don't trust this guest anymore because I know about vulnerabilities in version whatever, version one. But so we so we track that launch that launched uh, TCB. The, so the diagram describes um, also how you go back and forth. So um, we have if you're in the state that the diagram describes, where committed is version two, and the current is version three, to to raise that low watermark the, to 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 change the committed version, you execute SNP commit, and SNP commit, basically, all it does is change that version. But now the guest can start saying, uh, yeah, I'm on version three now, and you can trust me more. Um, it isn't until that committed version low watermark goes up that the guest can start using and seeing secrets um, released by the guest owner, by the relying party, um, that's associated with the trust that's, that's granted to version three. If for whatever reason, we're at a provisional installation, and we say, you know, nope, I don't want to do that. Hypervisor can execute download firmware EX, and this function basically loads the new firmware image and will set the current version back to the committed version whenever it gets rolled back. So this is a table of the platform measurements that we put into the attestation report. Each of you, if you look into our spec, the, each of the uh, these lines here are lines in the uh, in the attestation report. So, current TCB, like I said, it's informational. Um, if if the the firmware that's running is 
could be rolled back in the, in the future, you don't want to trust it necessarily. So we say that we put current here for potentially like development purposes, but it is informational. You should really trust and, and base your security decisions on the committed TCB. And the committed TCB tells you, I will never be at a lower state during the execution of lifetime of this particular guest. Um, and so you can use that to figure out, you know, do I trust this guest? The, uh, the reported TCB in the attestation report does a couple things. Um, it's an, it is the, uh, I think most importantly, reported TCB keys, it tells you which, um, uh, which key is used to sign this. We use a versioned key to sign each of the attestation reports based on the version of the platform. So reported TCB is, that, is one of the major keys to figuring out how do I find the certificate to validate this, 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 this report. Um, the chip ID there is also part of that. Our version key is, is chip unique, and so you need to go, when you go into our, our uh, key service, you wanna say, I have this chip ID, here's the TCB of my system, please give me a, um, uh, my, my version key. The, the launch, um, it tells you whether or not what, what, the, what, the, what the committed version of the guest was. Um, now, kind of a side comment on launch, it, it's something that could be more complicated than you might think. If you consider the case where a guest is migrated, the version that the system is at at a particular time may not be the actual system that the, the guest was launched at. So you may want to migrate and continually, transitively continue that guest's launch TCB across migration. And so that can tell you, even though it's moved across the world, it was actually launched at an older version. The, the platform info, which we haven't talked about yet, is a bit mask. It describes ultimately what the, syst what the platform's uh, configuration is at a given at the, at the time of, of the attestation report being generated. So um, currently we, we, we track two things. We're intending for this to be something that could be tracking more of things over time. Um, the first one is to say whether or not whole system memory encryption is enabled. We call it TSME, Transparent um, Secure Memory Encryption. Um, so if you cared that the system had full memory encryption, as in host memory encryption, that's something that doesn't have to do with confidential compute, but you care that you know, even shared pages are encrypted with something, then you would look for that bit. Um, also, if you wanted to say, I don't want to run a, on a system that has SMT enabled, which is the simultaneous multi-threading with sibling threads, two, two hardware threads in the same core, you can say, you know, I don't want that. And one reason why you might want, not want that is if you're particularly concerned about the side channels that could happen on, sit between two sibling threads. So this is a good uh, a bit vector to look at if you want to have, if you have particular concerns about the, the, uh, the platform configuration uh, at a whole, as a whole. So going to guest measurements. Um, to launch a guest, we have three commands, roughly start, update, finish. Kind of mirrors how you would do a, you know, in a hash, a hash function. You know, I start it, initialize the context, do a bunch of updates on each of the pages of the guest, and then we call a single finish operation to cap it all off and, 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 and uh, complete the operation. Each update operation is executed on a single page, and that page is being placed is a, is a plain text page that the hypervisor has. You know, you can imagine having a uh, Ubuntu image CD that you want to turn into a, uh, a confidential guest. Well, the CD is unencrypted, um, but you need to make it encrypted. You need to make it prepared for doing confidential compute. So as the, the security processor is processing these commands, it has the notion of where the, uh, where the page is in system physical memory, as well as where it is inside the guest physical memory space. And so what we do is we take the contents of that page and some of the page metadata, like you know, its GPA, 
what kind of pages it, it is, like if it's a page that's intended to contain guest, you know, pre-initialized data, does it contain um, the register save state area, the VMSA for, for execution, like the initial like CPU state, um, or if it contains, you know, other special kinds of pages that we've defined, all that metadata is placed into a structure and the contents of the page and that metadata is extended into a running launch digest. So as each of these update operations occur, we are measuring the state, the initial state of that guest. And so once we get finished, we have a launch update, a launch digest that can be used to say, you know, objectively, this is what is actually launched. Um, note that our launch digest isn't really a running hash. It's kind of done in the terms of a PCR extension. So uh, the notion here is that we take the launch digest that we've previously had and we concatenate that roughly with the page metadata and the page and we hash that again and we replace the old hash, old digest with the new digest. So once we get to launch finish, um, this is when we want to finish off the, the launch operation, get the guests ready to go, among other things like um, uh, you know, doing some of the SOC initialization to say, you know, install new encryption keys or, or actually saying the, you know, the guests can start reading those keys uh, through their through memory controller. We also have um, the final step, which is this ID block. Um, and I have a slide uh, after this, but Ultimately, the ID block contains information about what the guest owner expects the guest to look like. So it, is, it contains, of, among several other things, it contains the launch digest um, of, of what it expects, and it, expect, it has, contains the expected guest policy. Now, I don't have a slide here that describes the, um, the, the, the guest policy, but um, the guest policy describes some, um, some runtime decisions that we care uh, that you might care about like allowing debug commands to be executed sometimes I mean in most cases you want that to be disabled so that's the kind of thing that's in the guest policy <clears throat> so the the ID block is produced by the guest owner uh, the ID block contains all this information that you've produced at the image creation time, you're saying, I have this image, this Ubuntu disk or whatever it happens to be, and I have all this information I want it, I expect it to look like after it's been launched. And I wanna make sure that at the, at the first instruction that that is actually being enforced. And so the ID block contains this information and you produce it at the same time you, you create the image. And then you have a ID key. So this IDE key is owned by the guest owner and it signs the ID block. Um, and uh, when, when the launch finish command is executed, the firmware receives the signed ID block and the public key of the ID key pair. And it, it validates, first of all, the, the signature of the ID block and if that passes, then it enforces the, the contents, the, the, the small policy that's inside the ID block. We also have optionally a, a way to have an author key, which we've just called, um, that signs the ID, block, ID key and to, to be able to support a perhaps more flexible PKI around, uh, around signing these blocks. So one of the things that's inside the ID block is some image metadata. Um, we have a family ID, an image ID, a guest SVN. None of these fields here are actually parsed or looked at by the firmware. We just collect them from the ID block and stash them away in a guest context inside of our firmware. And then when we, we create the attestation report, um, we, we place these fields into the report. And so this can be used for tracking the images that you've produced. Um, it can also 
It can also be a way to um, decouple the production of the image with a particular measurement from the guest owner looking at a, an image and saying, I trust this image. So you can imagine a case where you produce uh, you know, image ID 5 and with a, some measurement, right? And you, you, you roll it out into the cloud, and at some point there's a vulnerability in it. Well, I'm oh, well, sorry, at some point there's a non-security a non related functional update to this image. Like you do you know, app get update and you just pull a new package or whatever it happens to be. And you don't really care about the measurement at the time you, you, you do the attestation uh, interpretation. So you just say, I just need to see image ID 5. So when the new version of the image is created, the, uh, a new ID block with a new measurement is there because the measurement has been matched. But the, ID, the image ID can be used to um, raise up the interpretation of you know, what does it mean for this image to be, you know, have this measurement. Well, perhaps the guest owner doesn't know at that time. He just says, I need to know. I need to see image 5. We do place the measurement in the attestation report. So if you wanted to, you can disregard the ID block, and you can look at the measurement and check that out. Um, you know, it, it's the same measurement that we produced during launch, uh, during launch. We also have, in order for you to trust that the right ID block was used, or the, the one that was associated with your image, because perhaps the hypervisor in, invented its own key, it placed its own public key into the launch finish, and it, it has a malicious ID block. Well, we take a digest, a fingerprint basically, of the ID key and if the author key if present, and we put it into our attestation report. So you can go look to say, you know, maybe you want to bring up, bring your, your, your guest policy up or guest uh, owner relying party attestation interpretation up another level. So you might say, I don't care. I don't care about any of the other metadata. I just want to know that it came from me at some point. So you may say, as long as the ID key digest matches something that I, matches a key that I own, then I, that's, that's good enough for me. The, the guest policy is placed in the attestation report. It tells you, again, you know, what, um, whether debug is enabled or other various things. Um, and then we have this last line. I don't have a, 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 a slide for this, but we have a notion of a migration agent. Um, this is a special guest that has a special relationship with the guest that's launched. And its job is to essentially assist in the migration of a guest. This isn't a necessary feature. We have other ways to do it. But if you were to say, if you were to imagine, say, uh, a single tenant has multiple guests, it, they could have all of its guests bind with a single migration agent. And that migration agent can be in charge of looking at a, uh, a, the receiving uh, machine that's going to take that guest. So um, the, the, the guest has the, so this, this migration agent has the ability to see a lot of the secrets of that of the other guest. So it is within the TCB of that guest. So if you're using a migration agent, we have a unique report ID that we generate randomly. It's like a 128-bit value. And um, each attestation report contains the report ID of the migration agent, which is which has to be an SMB guest. So when you're, when you're reviewing an attestation report and you see that there are, um, a migration agent report ID is in the attestation report, you need to say, wait a second, a migration agent is bound to this. Do I expect that? If no, then re reject the attestation report. But if yes, then go compare to uh, the, you know, the, report, the, the attestation report of that, that migration agent. So how do you, how do you, how do you determine the authenticity of an attestation report. So in our, in our parts, we have a chip unique secret burned into fuses at manufacturing time. And this secret is essentially mixed with the security version numbers, the TCB version in total, of the platform. So uh, anytime the SNP firmware SVN bumps, 
then you need a new, a different VCK, different uh, version key, attestation key. Uh, if the microcode patch changes, you need a different key. Um, so in order to support that, uh, we have a, a signing service or a, a, a key service that you can go request given the, the unique chip identifier and the, um, the, the version, you get, you get back a certificate chain for that, uh, for that VCK. So a guest needs to go retrieve that in order to process a particular attestation report. So um, what do you do with, uh, with an attestation report? Um, like how, do you, how do you make it useful? So you, you, you could, you know, I think there was a talk yesterday about all the different methods of attesting different chunks of, uh, of an image. Um, you could, you know, only do the bootloader and then everything has to bootstrap from there. Or you can, on the other side of the spectrum, measure the entire guest image and then you don't have to do anything. So somewhere in between where you're chaining trust from a, you know, a kernel or a kernel and an it RD um, to the rest of user space, you want to be able to use our attestation report. So when the attestation report is requested by the guest itself, the guest can say, here is 64 bytes of opaque data that I want you to place into the report. Um, it's not interpreted by firmware. We just blindly put it in there. And the intent is for the guest to put something in there that identifies itself cryptographically. Um, so the, the, you know, the, what we envision is that a guest creates a key pair and that ephemerally, like on, on each guest instance, it wouldn't be something saved to disk. It would be something you generate on the fly. You place the digest of that key pair inside the report data. And then now, when somebody processes and accepts an attestation report, they now have a cryptographic binding using our, our chip unit key to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the new ephemeral key that the guest created. So it's kind of like the attestation report is a, it's a kind of bespoke certificate for that key. Um, and so one use case that's been discussed in the past week is use that key, that report data to, to, to uh, uh, certify, so to speak, the endorsement key of a VTPM. So as I mentioned, the, the guest is the one who retrieves a, uh, an attestation report. Um, we have a secure channel we have a secure channel between the guest and the security processor that the hypervisor cannot, uh, cannot see or cannot, cannot break into the plain text. It's an it's a encrypted channel. Um, <clears throat> the, the messages that are at the center of that channel are defined in our spec, one of, them, one of which is the message report request message. This is the message that's gonna contain that report data and it's gonna be wrapped up in the, in the, in the trusted channel sent to the security processor, and the security processor is going to send back another message in that channel that's gonna contain the attestation report. <clears throat> the, the hypervisor is just simply the transport here. So it's gonna receive the packet from the guest. It's, there's no um, direct communication to the security processor between the, the guest uh, and the security processor. It's actually hypervisor receiving the encrypted packet and then shuffling it off to the uh, the security processor. Um, then the hypervisor passes that to the security processor using this SNP guest request command. Um, so Linux has two sets of, or two device um, files that are used for managing SEV. Uh, in, the, in the host, or in the guest that is, there's this dev SEV, SEV guest, and through that device file, you can retrieve the attestation report um, you know, the, to, to, uh, to, get, um, to get it from the, the security processor. There are, there's two ioctals, get report and get, this is the extended get report. The extended get report allows you to ask for both the attestation report 
and the certificate. So in this case, what you're looking at is, um, is the, the, the host is already going to prefetch, or it can, in, this, in this mechanism, can prefetch the, the, the certificate for you. So it knows what platform you're on. It knows what version of the platform, uh, it knows what version of the platform firmware you are, you're using. So it can go retrieve that certificate ahead of time. And so whenever you ask for the attestation report, it can funnel that through. And the hypervisor can provide that, the host can provide that through dev SCB um, through this uh, set extended configuration. So um, ultimately, SNP attestation is, allows us to measure and, and gain confidence in the platform and in the guest configuration. Um, it can bootstrap, bootstrap these deeper chains of attestation. So if you wanted to put a VTPM in the guest, that's, this is how you would connect it to the hardware. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I finished these slides, Tom was the only one, Tom's uh, conversation was the only one I knew about that had to do with this, but there have actually been several talks in the past week talking about SVSM, VTPM, attestation. So you know, I encourage you guys to go check those out. Um, we also have some tooling that we're working on with the community. Um, there's an SCV tool um, uh, GitHub repository that talks, that has a, it's a multi-tool for various things. Um, and we also have uh, another one that's being developed uh, through the community for, uh, currently it's in Rust. It has um, support for some of the legacy interfaces that we have. Um, but there's a, a pull request that's being processed right now that, that adds SMP and attestation bits and pieces to it. So the, the future work here is us and you guys potentially contributing more to that, um, to that tooling. Okay, and that's all I've got. Any questions? Does SMP support like, can, can it be used like, like when it's Okay, so, so can it, does it support nested virtualization? It does not. Okay, okay. I've been wondering that for a while, so I had to ask. Thank you. In, in terms of your attestation report, mm -hmm. you only mentioned attesting version numbers, mm -hmm. and it looked like that might only be related to the VCEK. Does the attestation report include the version numbers of the firmware that is being reported? So our firmware tracks, we have two versions associated with a, with a firmware image. We have a, you know, a classic version number that we associate with it. Um, and then we have a security version number. Security version number ticks along only whenever we have security related updates. And so it's the security version number that we're tracking in the firmware. And that, that comes in the attestation report? Yes. But you might lie about that if I haven't acknowledged the, the version current versus reported. If I update the firmware underneath and I haven't yet committed that version number and I'm running on a newer version of the firmware, is that visible in the attestation report in any way? Um, so you're saying you've, let's see, let's pull up the slide here. What, what I'm missing is um, I don't see how the guest can trust the version of underlying firmware that's being provided. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because you're only providing version numbers, not actual hashes of the components from, from the description here. And secondly, because you have this mechanism by which the underlying firmware and hypervisor um, pretend to the guest that the firmware hasn't been updated. So as the guest, how do I know what actual underlying pieces I'm running off? Where's your attestation of um, the platform that I'm running on? Even, even if I haven't done the update or whatever, I should. I still want to be able to see that something has changed underneath me in, the, in terms of the environment I'm running in, and I don't see where that piece is. Right, so um, I, I, let's, let's talk about the, the versions for, you know, you know, you've updated and you wanna see that, that something has happened. Um, so uh, what we, we report, all of this. In fact, we, we don't even just report the, the SVNs. We report the actual version numbers inside the attestation report as well. Um, I didn't talk about it here because 
those version numbers aren't as critical to security. But we do show that things are changing out from underneath you. The, the reported TCB, in terms of lying, so to speak, um, it needs to, it needs to be less than or equal to the committed version. So it can't be anything higher. So in, with, the, with the assumption that um, uh, as you increase the version, it gets more secure. I mean, that may be a tenuous argument, but um, um, the, uh, the, the, the security version, the, the reported version never goes higher than committed. So you can't lie to say, oh yeah, you're, you're at a high level, good for you, and you're secure. Um, so we, we limit that. Um, and, and for the current version, we report the current version of the firmware as well as we report the current TCB, the current v, uh, SVN of the, of the firmware. Now, to your question about hashes, um, we don't actually report the hashes of the firmware. Um, I think I suppose it could be you know something to look into in terms of you know, extra information to provide. A lot of times hashing is more difficult because you're 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 trying to track you know um, it's it's hard to interpret that particularly from vendors whenever we're going to say trust you know you're just going to have to just take the latest um, a version number does almost the same thing. But I agree there could be some cases where uh, it would be better to have the, the, the measurement. I've seen firmware vendors ship exactly the same version with differences is sort of like you, you can't see. always trust. Right. In an ideal world, of every version is unique. Every version gets um, right. you know, incrementally better. It, it's always good to actually have some visibility. Even if, you, if it's an opaque value, it's still a, a value that changes that means you can tell something is different. Yeah, good point. So what I'm gathering is that the version number is connected to a specific release of that firmware, and it's not a um, incremental indication of this is the next, uh, I guess, a serial, not necessarily a serial number, but a, a commit, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a, a an indication of uh, the serial serially committed versions that have been um, committed in that particular device. So you may have skipped a certain number, uh, certain versions, uh, released versions of the firmware in that platform, um, but it's a, a basically an update number of how many times it has been updated on this particular platform. Uh, no. Um, okay, so, so it's so it's basically a release number. It, it's a release number. Yeah. Okay, we, we have we have a direct relationship between SVN and release number. Okay, yeah. So you were talking about the boot measurements. I wonder if it includes the UFI, and if so, is are we expected the guest to put the the measure the, the measurement in the ID block as well? So it is, it's entirely up, so we don't control what actually is measured. Um, all the, so, so it's up to the hypervisor and the guest ecosystem to decide how do you load and, and, and do that initial launch. So it's really up to say, you know, Red Hat to decide, okay, we're gonna launch just the UFI and kernel and, and everything else is loaded later. Um, and then that launch image is what's actually being measured. So it's entirely up to the ecosystem and the operating system distros to say how they want to, to, to determine what's, what's actually measured in this attestation report. Now that goes to the question of like chaining attestation, right? If you're not going to measure you know, user space, or if you're not gonna measure um, uh, anything past UFI, you, know, you need another next step in that chain to measure the rest of it. So for one, th one thing that's been talked about is you measure this SVSM, this like separate module inside the, the, the guest image that contains a, a virtual TPM. And then that virtual TPM is used to uh, test the rest of the way. Okay, so, the ID, so what, what, what the guest put in the ID block should match what the hypervisor is basically putting in the measurement. Yeah, I mean, since the ID block is controlled by the guest owner and by the, by the image make maker, 
um, the image maker just has to make sure that those measurements inside the ID block match the image, the, that launch image that they're setting up. Okay. You mentioned um, that the measurements of the firmware include the security version number and so on. Um, and that wasn't really in force anyway, so the firmware developers can just choose whatever they want as a, the version number, that, and you just have to assume it's correct if they've signed it correctly and so on. Um, and you also mentioned that the entire point of this in the first place is to work around the concept of a malicious cloud vendor and so on. But the way that cloud vendors are deploying hardware these days, they typically have access to the source code for the firmware, they might be writing that firmware themselves. So doesn't that undermine the story if they could just release a, a later version of the firmware that completely undermines the security? Good question. So when I, when I speak of firmware in this, this context, I really mean our SOC firmware. AMD controls 100% that, that code and we sign it. And it is our job to make sure that Anything that we sign, we make sure that we manage the SVNs get incre incremented correctly. We manage that you know the the, the firmware isn't going to uh, maliciously roll back patch security patches as we increment that SVN uh, number. So it is entirely ours. I think maybe you know there's there's all, all this kind of stuff around x86 firmware which we don't control. Um, so UFI and other things inside of a guest or or, or inside the host too. But um, yeah, we, we AMD controls that SOC firmware. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you very much.